Good morning. Welcome to Applied Mathematical Finance. I like to do a small session today on yeah, defaultable products, defaultable bonds, credit default spreads. But maybe the important part of the session is how I can integrate uh, a deterministic discount curve related to, for example, a defaultable bond, yeah, so a credit spread curve into a given, so into any given uh, valuation model that did not consider default a priori. And um, this links back to our discussion of the discrete term structure model, yeah, the LIBOR market model, uh, because we already did this technique, yeah, but did not view it from that point. I also sometimes mentioned that in this section, but uh, this is a general trick, yeah, and you can apply it to also short rate models, other models. So uh, it maybe did not fit uh, into the section on the forward rate model. So it's a general technique that you can extend. Uh, yeah, any given valuation model to consider an additional discount curve or additional discount curves. So let me start yeah, with defaultable bonds. Um, when I mentioned uh, collateralization, so we had this nice session on collateralization. I already mentioned, okay, everything we did so far was wrong. Yeah? We assumed that there is a risk-free zero copper bond that guarantees a payment of one unit at a future point in time. And we uh, yeah, uh, mentioned that uh, all products have some kind of counterparty risk. Yeah? So it appeared as if all this risk-free single curve interest rate theory was wrong. But then we recovered because we saw that uh, collateralization, yeah, so posting collateral, actually can create um, a meaningful single curve world yeah, where all this um, applies. So we already encountered defaultable bonds. So we started our considerations of interest rates with the definitions of zero copper bonds that guarantee the payment, the zero copper bond was somehow our fundamental atomic object from which we then derived quantities. Yeah, so the derived quantities were, for example, forward rates, short rates, swap rates, coupon bonds. Yeah, we could value coupon bonds with the zero copper bonds, floaters, yeah, forward rates, uh, and fixed rates paid in, uh, in a financial product and so on. So, uh, of course, later we uh, had the comment that the green things are maybe the things that we observe. For example, we observe a swap, the value of a swap, yeah, or we observe a past swap rate, and then we can infer our atomic zero copper bonds, the underlying zero copper bonds that create these uh, observed objects. Um, so this zero copper bond in our definition represented the value of a guaranteed payment of one unit yeah, in time capital T. Yeah, so the so the important part here is guaranteed. But uh, this guarantee does not exist. So there could be uh, events. Yeah, so. For example, the issuer could go bankrupt yeah, and you only get back part of the money or you do not get back the money. So the object that I observe is the defaultable zero copper bond, so P superscript D. Yeah, and the default can then occur anytime between now when I observe the bond and the maturity. Actually, I observe many of such bonds. So each issuer has 
its own defaultable bond. Yeah, so you can observe, for example, in US government bond, uh, a bond related to some company. Yeah, company likes to uh, get money and issues bonds. Yeah, and all these objects have then different prices. You observe different prices even if they have the same maturity, if they pay the same coupon or whatever, they have done different prices um, because the market attributes different risk. You know, that you get your money back. So different uh, default uh, probabilities. So in the following, the P superscript D denotes a defaultable bond for some uh, issuer. So you see already, I have now many such uh, bond curves. Yeah, maybe I have the risk-free curve. Well, risk-free. Yeah? Okay, I mentioned this does not exist. What does it mean? Well, go back to our session on collateral. It means the curve may be associated with collateralized in, in, uh, instruments. So it is the curve that is associated with the collateral rate, the interest rate paid on the collateral, and we saw that. This defines then a discount curve and all the collateral products are associated with this discount curve. So now I have multiple, uh, so many uh, discount curves. So there is some curve here, uh, maybe some curve here. Okay, and maybe there is somewhere the curve, we had P superscript C, yeah, so which is also a discount curve, the collateral curve. And also interesting topic is how you say calibrate uh, these curves here, uh, because this market is not so liquid, yeah, there are many, many collateralized products from which you can infer maybe the collateral curve yeah so there are for example swaps that pay the collateral rate if the collateral rate is um, um, a reference rate there are swaps on the backward rate of this reference rate so there's a lot of information on the market that you can calibrate this object here but uh, these objects the Zero copper bonds, yeah, there are maybe only few bonds issued yeah, for different maturities by this issuer, and it's a little bit difficult to extract this information. Then there are credit default swaps from which you also may uh, extract part of the information. So um, the fitting of this curve is uh, a little bit more complicated and for example methods like bootstrapping yeah that does not uh, they they do not work so well in this situation yeah? so for example uh, it can happen that you have maturity here and the defaultable bond price for different maturities here and then you um, observe prices that uh, lie a little bit strangely here so there is some uncertainty and you have to fit a curve into into this data yeah? so it's more um, a fitting that's a topic of its own i assume that we are now given such discount discount curves from this defaultable curve i can now derive all the quantities yeah, we defined for the non-defaultable curve. Yeah? So it's just a zero copper bond curve I have. So I can now just derive uh, a forward rate from that. Yeah? So it's maybe more a synthetic uh, definition. So I can derive a defaultable instantaneous forward rate yeah? that was here the slope of the logarithm of the zero copper bond curve. And if I have the family of instantaneous defaultable forward rate curves, you can recover the zero copper bond curve. Yeah? So that's exactly the same. And now also you could try to set up models that models the default curve yeah, in a stochastic way. Yeah? So like for example, 
modeling uh, default will forward rate. Usually you do this on top of a model that already models the non-defaultable, for example, the collateral curve. So you have a um, hybrid model. If you model this on top of, say, the risk-free curve uh, or your collateral curve, then um, you are maybe interested in what is the difference of the two quantities. Yeah? So how much does a defaultable forward rate lie above? Yeah? So usually it lies above the uh, non-defaultable forward rate. And this difference is then uh, often called the spread. That is the reason why I have in the title credit default spread. Yeah, it is the additional amount yeah, you observe to compensate for the probability of default. And there is a nice interpretation of this difference. So first, the definition. Uh, assume I have now my defaultable zero copper bond curve. Okay, and I have the non-defaultable curve from which I know the instantaneous forward rate. Yeah? So that is maybe the collateral curve So there is a curve P, yeah, so without the superscript given, yeah, could be our P superscript C, the collateral curve, which I view as the basis curve. Yeah? So this guy here. Um, then I can just define the difference of these two instantaneous rates. You can also define it using the simple forward rate, but here it's defined with the instantaneous forward rates. So the interest rate you um, observe in little t for the maturity capital T. And you can define the difference of these two as lambda of t t. Yeah, and if you go back to the relation between bond and instantaneous forward rate, so the bond price for a maturity capital T is the exponential minus the integral of the instantaneous forward rate with respect to the maturity argument. Okay, that's just the definition we get from that definition. Yeah, then if you plug this in and you look at the ratio of the two bonds, so the ratio of the two bonds is the ratio of two exponentials, is the exponential of the difference. So you see that the ratio of the defaultable zero copper bond divided by the non-defaultable zero copper bond is just the exponential minus integral of this spread of our credit spread. So this is a nice object. So the lambda is a nice object. So you can express, if you view it in this form here, you can express the defaultable zero copper bond as the non-defaultable zero copper bond multiplied with an additional discount factor. Yeah? So this looks li like, this looks like a, a, a zero copper bond, yeah? but it's now the additional factor that I have to multiply to the non-defaultable part to get the defaultable part. So it is that this guy here encodes the additional yeah, uh, degradation of the price you know, related to default. And this object has now a very nice uh, interpretation. In the absence of arbitrage, I have that the value of the defaultable bond is smaller than that of the risk-free bond. Okay, so note this, this is the guy that guarantees the payment. This is the guy that only in some situation pays the amount. Yeah. So here, yeah, there are 
actually more events where you get the amount. Yeah? In the other one, there are fewer amount, uh, events where you get the same amount to one unit. So it's clear uh, that the defaultable guy should be uh, cheaper. But if zero compartment is smaller, it means that an interest rate defined on this object is larger. Yeah. So if you think of a for simple forward rate, zero copper bond price is equal to one divided by one plus L times delta T. Yeah? So the interest rate is higher. So the issuer has to pay a larger coupon yeah, to make this thing equal to one. Yeah? So he pays something to compensate you yeah, for the risk that you do not receive uh, the money. Yeah, if uh, this would not be the case, it would be an arbitrage. You can now you know, think think of different scenarios how you construct such an arbitrage. Yeah, so it means that uh, this difference here, owning a default uh, default free zero Cooper bond, yeah, so buying maybe something that has almost no def default. Yeah. You could also think now of the spread of two um, defaultable zero copper bonds with different uh, default intensities, a government bond versus a corporate bond. This difference then would constitute an arbitrage because it has a negative value, but it has um, a non-negative uh, future payouts. Yeah? There, there are events where, where it pays. So where this guy defaults and this guy does not default. So. Actually, this is a bit tricky because you have to um, think, okay, what is this guy? This guy here means that you issue a bond. yeah. So it is your own bond. And this uh, strategy here is a bit, a bit strange because you profit from your own default. yeah. So you can issue a bond and invest your money in risk-free operations, but you have the option to default and do not pay back uh, your bond. So um, a strange, strange thing, but uh, it is an, um, it would be an arbitrage if that is the case. Okay, so let's assume that we have this very natural relation that my synthetic uh, or idealized risk-free bond uh, is always larger or equal than any defaultable bond. Then I have that the ratio which I had on the previous slide, yeah, oops. So the ratio which I had on the previous slide, which is related to the spread, my lambda, this ratio is between zero and one. And the natural uh, interpretation is that I can now interpret this guy as a probability, yeah, so either the survival probability or default probability. So that is the survival probability. So this term has an intuitive interpretation. So it may be viewed as the market implied probability of survival. So the probability that we do not have default uh, from the observation time or valuation time, little t, to the maturity, capital T. So because if you look at this ratio at maturity, then, okay, what is this ratio of the defaultable bond divided by the non-defaultable bond at maturity? So at maturity, this guy here below is equal to one. It pays you one guaranteed, but this guy here on top, so now assume that I make an idealization, default is ju just a binary event, yeah, either I get zero or I get everything, then this guy is the indicator function. Yeah? So it is the indicator function, did default happen? Yeah? So if tau is now the default time, then this is the expectation of the indicator function. Uh, so it is the probability that the default time is 
larger than capital T, so default did not occur before t ca uh, capital T. So it means that we up to capital T survive. Well, conditional that I already know, uh, so I have to restrict this, conditional that I already know that we have survived up to time little t, because otherwise I could not uh, observe uh, this object. This object would no longer exist yeah, if, if we did not survive up to time little t. Yeah, so I can interpret this as the survival probability. So this guy is a probability, namely the survival probability uh, under our valuation measure here, Q, P, T. Important it is the market implied survival probability. So it is the price that is attributed by the market to this zero comma bond. Yeah, so it is what the, the market thinks about this probability of default. Doesn't need to be the real probability. Okay, so if this guy is the survival probability, yeah, then the opposite event is the default probability. So one minus is the default probability. And yeah, also as a remark here in our interpretation, default means that we pay zero. So if you have this interpretation that the ratio of the defaultable bond divided by the non-defaultable bond is this survival probability, then yeah, clearly the lambda is an intensity. Yeah? So the parameter lambda is called the default intensity. It has a unit one divided by time. Uh, so you have an exponential distribution uh, and lambda is the intensity parameter. Here in this general setup, lambda can still be a stochastic process. So you see there is here an off T. Uh, it is the forward rate curves I observe in little t from which I have created the difference. So there is here an little t. It is an FT measurable stochastic process. So the market implied probabilities can change yeah, as we observe here these two uh, stochastic process. If this lambda is deterministic, so I have now a deterministic default intensity, then we already have an easy trick to include the ability to model different discount curves into all our valuation models. Yeah? Not only our discrete forward rate model, but also the short rate models and uh, whatever. So first, the deterministic default uh, intensity. So note, this was my previous remark that so far it's possible that lambda is a stochastic process. Okay, and now let's make the simplifying assumption that this lambda is deterministic. So we have a deterministic default um, intensity. So I assume I have a general non-defaultable valuation model given. So with some numerea n and equivalent martingale measure associated with this numerea. So I know how to value zero copper bonds and all kinds of non-defaultable products. Or uh, in this situation, which we had before, say it could be just the bubble of all the collateralized products. associated with the collateral curve, yeah, which is given here by this P. So this links back to our 
session on collateral. Yeah, assume I have this model given. It is a single curve model with respect to this uh, collateral curve. And the collateral curve could then be a complicated model by a complicated stochastic model where we have the discrete forward rates yeah, modeled as stochastic processes. So these uh, could then have volatilities correlations. Yeah? So it could be a very complicated model that is hidden here in our numeraire n. Yeah? So actually the numeraire n builds up the whole, whole model. Then I can value a defaultable zero copper bond by just multiplying the non-defaultable payoff. So the non-defaultable payoff is here my one, yeah, valued here in my valuation model with the corresponding survival probability. So with the exponential, yeah, integrated from little t to capital T minus lambda d tau. So integrated from little t to capital T over the period yeah, where I may experience default that is relevant for this payoff. So up to its payment time. Yeah? So actually you just multiply that you get this yeah, amount, but with a certain probability. And you see that this is, um, now I have here a deterministic lambda. So if this deterministic, if this object here is deterministic, I can move it of course out as a multiplicative factor. And you see that we exactly get this equation, defaultable zero comma bond is non-defaultable zero copper bond multiplied with the survival probability. So I get exactly this thing by this construction. And I can generalize this to say any non, uh, any uh, defaultable uh, payoff. Yeah? So assume that V superscript D is the payoff that you get conditional to non-default, but it is a defaultable payoff. So in case of default, you get zero. Yeah? Then you plug this in and multiply it with the survival probability. So the probability that you get this payoff to get the value of the defaultable V uh, superscript D. Alternatively, what is happening here, you can just think of, okay, you have the expectation of say some value. Okay, so say some V of capital T divided by the N of capital T. And you only get this if you do not default. So what you write here is just, you write here the indicator function that tau is larger than capital T. Okay, and then you just assume that you can decompose this. To the non-defaultable value and the indicator function. Yeah, and if you, if your model, a defaultable model, actually you, build this accordingly, yeah? So you have two filtrations, the filtration related to the non-defaultable events, yeah? And then the filtration uh, related to the defaultable events, yeah? You can then define the product uh, measure, yeah? So you could uh, do it like that. Uh, <clears throat> of course, your model could also be more complicated where there is maybe a correlation, uh, of default yeah, to say the level of interest rates where this then does, does, does not hold. And yeah, if you look, for example, the defaultable discrete forward rate model, defaultable labor market model, yeah, then you see how this, this can be done. Yeah, So where you can model correlation of the default intensity to the interest rate level. Yeah, So that's, that's an easy job. And then you can do not 
do this decomposition. But here in my example, I assume that this thing here is deterministic. So I can just move it out you know, and I have this nice um, adjustment factor. If this default intensity is deterministic, yeah, there is a nice little observation. It does not depend on little t. Okay, that's a nice observation. So if you have a deterministic default intensity, well, to be precise, if the stochastic process of the ratio of the defaultable zero copper bond and the non defaultable zero copper bond does not have a DW term. So it's a E2 stochastic process, but it does not have a DW term. So E2 stochastic process with zero volatility. So also sometimes called locally risk free. Then I have that the lambda of little t, capital T, is just the lambda of capital T, so it does not depend on little t. So how do I see that? So first, if I have this assumption that this stochastic process is just some drift times dt, so the drift is then just differentiate here our survival probability with respect to little t, then I can just view this under my valuation measure associated with this zero copper bond, so the terminal measure. So I can just move to that measure. Gesanov tells me there will be no change in the drift. And I know that this guy is a martingale. So I know that this here has to be zero. Okay, so differentiating this uh, survival probability with respect to time um, is zero. So I have that differentiating this with respect to time is zero because the guy is a martingale. So let's carry this out. If you differentiate this with time, you get the exponential again, and then differentiate in the inside. So differentiating in the inside, I get two terms. So first I have to differentiate the integral with respect to the lower bound. It is a minus because I differentiate with respect to the lower bound, but there is another minus in front. So I have a lambda t tau, tau equals little t. So lambda t t, lambda little t, little t. And then I differentiate under the integral. So I have the second part. I differentiate the lambda with respect to here, its first argument. So I have the second part. So I find that this is zero. So if this is zero, yeah, then this term here does not matter. So it means that this guy here has to be zero. So if this is zero, yeah, then I have here on the left-hand side, lambda tt on the right-hand side, I have here something that depends on capital T. So I immediately have that this object here does not depend on capital T. So differentiating this guy here with capital T gives me a zero. So maybe I should write that this implies that, that this guy does not depend on capital T. So this means that if I differentiate this here with capital T, it is zero. So it means if I remove the integral, yeah, it is zero. Okay, and then I see that this is zero. So I see that it does not depend here on uh, little t. Yeah, funny result. So I can write here everything with just a single intensity yeah, uh, that only uh, depends here on the maturity. So I made this um, assumption that default means we get zero. Yeah? So we drop to zero, you get nothing. 
the market behaves a bit different. Yeah, if default occurs, you get some recovery. So there is the so-called recovery rate, and there are also different models. Yeah, with how much recovery do you get? When do you get recovery? Is it relative, proportional to the original amount, and so on? So I'm not looking into this, but if you have say a recovery R, you can always transform the model to split this into a non-defaultable part and a defaultable part in the sense where the defaultable part is that you get nothing. Yeah, So you can uh, move to this interpretation we had. So the intensity is the market implied probability yeah, or describes the market implied probability of survival and hence also of default. So now, how can I integrate this into any evaluation model? That was already here. So how can I integrate this into any evaluation model? I just add here this factor to my yeah, valuation payoff. So whenever a payoff is under default, I add or multiply with the corresponding probability yeah, that, that's an easy part, but there's also a very nice implementation. And now we are touching the point that we already had before. If I now have these two curves, so I have my non-defaultable curve of zero cobalt bonds, and I have my defaultable curve of the zero cobalt bonds. Then I calculate now this single credit spread curve minus one divided by capital T logarithm of the ratio of the two zero copper bonds. From that, I can calculate the forward credit spread. So if I have a time period starting in T1, ending in T2, yeah, it's just the difference of S of T2 times T2 minus S of T1 times T1 divided by the period length. And you see that now your adjustment factor is just the exponential of this S of T1 to T2 times the period length. Yeah? So like a forward rate, um, exponential of minus S times the period length. So this is your adjustment factor. And you place this adjustment factor inside any thing that you like to value, I would like to value it in little t, and it pays in ti. So it is the forward credit spread yeah, from little to t to ti multiplied with the period length, exponential minus of that, that is placed into this. Yeah? So this is how I now value um, a defaultable cash flow. And you can interpret this now. Well, if you think of valuation is take this expectation and multiply with the numerea in little t. And you see that actually this here is these two differences. Then you can just move this adjustment into the numerea. So you can view this actually as dividing by n times exponential plus the spread. Yeah? So the numerea that accrues, for example, with a higher interest rate, namely the defaultable rate. So you can view it as having two different numereas. Yeah? The numerea for the defaultable cash flows and the numerea for the non-defaultable cash flows. Yeah, that now maybe rings a bell. That's very similar to what we had for the collateralized instruments, where we also defined the collateral numerea, the numerea to be used for the collateralized instruments that was growing at the collateral curve. So I can just do the same trick again, and I will replace now my non-defaultable numerea with a defaultable numerea. So this defaultable numerea consists of 
take the non-default binomial and adjust it by, yeah, okay, so it is one divided by numeraria. Expectation of one divided by numeraria is the zero copper bond, yeah. So you remove the default free part by multiplying here with the zero copper bond and you add the default part by dividing with the default with zero copper bond. We already had this trick, yeah. So recall that in our discrete forward rate model, we looked at we looked at the zero cover bond error generated by the model. So there was, for example, this picture for the spot measure, this picture for the terminal measure. So when you calculate a zero cover bond, okay, if N of T is the bond that matures at the final time, then it is deterministic if I am at the final time. So the error was zero. If we go into spot measure, okay, we accumulate some error. So when we looked at this error, we were introducing a nice trick to correct for the numerical error. So we had exactly the same trick. The zero copper bond, where the error has been corrected, is the zero copper bond that has the numerical error multiplied with the zero copper bond that is associated with the numerical error. So I said zero copper bond here, yeah? So uh, I'm confused. So the trick is the numeraire that has the numerical error of zero copper bonds removed is the numeraire associated with your model that generates these numerical errors. And then you multiply with the zero copper bond that has the numerical error and you divide by your known analytic error free zero copper bond. So it's just the same trick, but now with different colors. Yeah, so from numerical error to error free. And now here, I go from risk free numeraire to risky numeraire. So now let's define this as my risky numeraire. So say this is my N superscript D Ti, yeah. So I have a risky numeraire. Replace your numeraire with this risky numeraire to value the risky, the defaultable payoffs. Now that I have done this little session, maybe also the code we had last time uh, when I discussed this numeraire correction uh, is also maybe a little bit clearer because. In this part of the code, I sometimes use the terms non-defaultable and defaultable. So let's have a look back at the code of our discrete term structure model, which exactly allows for this trick to use a separate discount curve. So I'm here in my library. So let's have a look at Monte Carlo interest rate models. And we had our Libor market model, our discrete term structure model. And there is a function that calculates the numeraire. So there is here the get numeraire. Okay. And in this get numeraire function, there was here a check if the model has an associated separate discount curve, then calculate. And then there is here now the word defaultable zero Cooper bond curve as of time zero. So there is a separate function that does this, but this function will use this discount curve. And calculate the non-defaultable by just taking the unadjusted numeraire, so the numeraire from my model, which I assume is the non-defaultable model. Uh, take one divided by the numeraire, okay? Take the average, the expectation of one divided by the numeraire. 
Okay, this is value the um, non-defaultable bond. Okay, so this here is the non-defaultable zero-core bond. And then replace the numerea yeah, by the numerea multiplied with the risk-free bond divided by the risky bond. So exactly here this equation, n times the risk-free bond divided by the risky bond. So you see that you see that the code we had there in our model actually links to this interpretation that the discount curve that is added to the model could belong to a risky curve yeah, to a model uh, yeah, a risky discounting, a defaultable discounting in a model that actually models stochastically only the risk-free curve. So it could be that this model, our forward rate curve, is derived from the collateral curve, and the discount curve is associated with an additional credit spread above this collateral curve, so with an additional default risk. But this is only done if the model has this additional discount curve. So now I can comment this here again. So I have the defaultable zero copper bond here. So which depends on the presence here of this discount curve. Then I calculate the non-defaultable zero copper bond. Okay, this is just take one divided by the numerator you know, from that the expectation. Yeah. So actually it is the numerator in zero. Yeah. So this here is the so this here is the numerator in zero. Yeah. So it is n of zero multiplied with expectation of one divided by n of capital T. So this is calculated there. This is the numerically calculated risk-free bond. Could be your collateral curve, yeah, whatever. So, but this one is numerically, yeah, because I have a numerical model here that models this curve. And then I do the adjustment that my new numerator, so this is now the defaultable numerator, is given by take the non defaultable numerator, multiply with the non defaultable bond, divide by the defaultable bond. So you see the trick uh, removes only the numerical error if this discount curve is just the same, yeah, the non-defaultable uh, curve, the same as the uh, curve that creates the forward rates. Yeah? So then this trick removes the numerical error and we had this in this earlier session, but you can also use it as a yeah, model model addition to model additional discount curves in in this model. And the only assumption is that now your credit spread is deterministic. Yeah, so this, by the way, this means that also your observed defaultable forward rates are stochastic. Yeah? It's only the difference of the two that is deterministic. Yeah? So in, in a certain sense, and namely in this this sense. So this is a very elegant, very simple way to make one single curve model a multi-curve model, but a multi-curve model in the sense that the other curves, they are stochastic, but the spread is deterministic. Yeah? So it is a model of curves where the curves remain somehow um, stacked yeah, in, in, in the same distance. If you would like to have a model where also the spread becomes stochastic, yeah, that's not so difficult. Yeah, you write e to stochastic processes for the spreads, and yeah, then have a multi-factor model. A nice remark in this direction is that we already did a little bit uh, this hybrid model, and this is actually hidden here in this interpretation, in this remark, because. You can interpret actually this ratio here 
you can interpret this ratio here as a currency exchange rate. So you can think of that there is a defaultable euro and a non-defaultable euro, like two different currencies. Then what you have there is like a currency exchange rate, like an FX forward. Yeah? So you can see this as an exchange rate of a two currency model. Yeah? So this modification that we do there is similar to an exchange rate. And this analogy is uh, really, really, really strong. Yeah? So whenever you have a defaultable payoff, you pay it in units of the foreign currency. So if you like to value it, you multiply it with the exchange rate and divide by the numerator. Or you could interpret this that you divide by the numerator adjusted with the exchange rate. Yeah. So this is uh, this analogy is really strong, and since you already know how to set up a cost currency model, yeah, so deriving, for example, the drift of the foreign currency um, interest rate uh, in the domestic uh, measure, yeah, you maybe also know how to model now this exchange rate uh, as a stochastic process. Yeah, you could just model this exchange rate now as a stochastic process and have a model where the credit spread is then stochastic. Okay, so this was it for this session. Yeah, so you see that um, you have actually two numerators if you think of short rates. So one numerator is exponential RT with the risk-free rate, and the other numerator is exponential R plus lambda T, yeah, which gives you the defaultable short rate, yeah, the defaultable numerator then. Okay, so that was it for this little excursion in to how to integrate deterministic discount curves into maybe any given valuation model. That was it for today.